everyone, welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, Chinese President Xi Jinping convenes with key Central Asian countries in Uzbekistan for the 15th Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, with economy partners high on the agenda this year. And the countdown begins, suspense hands in the air as Britain enters the final hours of its historic Brexit poll. After years of heated debate, will Britain decide to remain or leave? We we'll begin today's show with Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to Uzbekistan, the final stop of his three-nation tour. On Thursday, leaders from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization met in Tashkent, capital of Uzbekistan, for its annual summit. The Chinese president met with several heads of state, including the president of Tajikistan, Mongolia, and Turkmenistan. On Wednesday, while addressing the Uzbek parliament, President Xi called for the building of a green, healthy, intelligent, and peaceful Silk Road. As an important part of the Belt and Road Initiative, he and his Uzbek counterpart, Islam Parimov, inaugurated a railway tunnel. The tunnel is part of a railway line connecting Tashkent and the eastern city of Namagan. This year is the 15th anniversary of the SCO. In addition of the anti-terrorism high on the agenda, members are also expected to exploring economic cooperation. Before we go to our panelists for that, let's take a look at this. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or SCO, is a mental organization that was founded in Shanghai in 2001. The territory of its six members China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan cover three fifths of the Eurasian continent. The member nations' combined population make up a quarter of the people living on the planet today. There are also two new exceeding members to the SCO India and Pakistan, four observer nations, and six dialogue partners. The SCO originally focused on security concerns, eliminating threats of terrorism, separatism, and extremism in Eurasia. Members are committed to military cooperation and intelligence sharing. Economic cooperation and connectivity have become another pillar of the SCO. Regional cooperation has expanded to energy, transportation, telecommunication, education, and cultural exchanges. For more on the SCO or Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, we are joined here in our Beijing studio by Mr. Yang Mingjie, who is the Vice President of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. Mr. Yang, such a pleasure to have you here in the studio. Meanwhile, joining us from Moscow in Russia, we are having Mr. Alexander Looking, Professor and Director of East Asian and SCO Studies at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Welcome. And from Washington, D.C. in the U.S., we are joined by Mr. Jeffrey Mankoff, who is Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Russia-Eurasian Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome as well. First of all, may I have your opinion, the two of you coming from China and Russia, about the change of nature and the change of size of the SCO. Mr. Yang here in Beijing, where looking at two new members and even more joining SCO, Pakistan, India. Meanwhile, it is, seems the discussion is not just limited to terrorism anymore, but rather economic and trade issues as well. What do you make of this change? I think that this time the summit of SCO can be regarded as a new beginning of the mechanism for regional cooperation, which means that uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has become from the security mechanism to the comprehensive cooperation mechanism, not only including the counterterrorism issues, but also economic cooperation as well as uh, social cooperation and the change. Why is it so important, Mr. Looking, the change, the change of nature, the change of size? Well, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is an open organization. If you read its charter, it says that anybody who are from this region, the Eurasian region, as it says, uh, can be a member. Uh, so from the very beginning, several countries wanted to be part of it as a full member. 
Uh, and today it is, it's very important that for the first time they accepted two, uh, two new members. Uh, it is important because these are both uh, India and Pakistan are big countries and uh, uh, we, with their uh, it's going to be a very uh, probably the, uh, surely the largest uh, uh, organization in the world if we c count the population mm. but also uh, what is very important that as um, you said uh, as my colleague rightly said the questions of uh, economic cooperation were discussed from the very beginning, but unfortunately there was not, uh, not much progress uh, on this, in this field. Uh, while security questions are mm, solved quite, uh, quite successfully. I see. So I think that the entrance of India and Pakistan, two big economies, will uh, give a good push for economic, multi economic cooperation within the organization. Mr. Mankov, coming from outside, from the U.S., what do you think about the change, apparently change of nature of SCO? What kind of message does it send to the others across the Pacific region? Well, I think that the fact that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is expanding both in terms of its membership and in terms of its mandate um, is a sign that the organization uh, has grown up a little bit and is developing um, a personality, if you will. Um, in the United States, when it was first founded, there was a lot of concern, especially because of the security focus, that this was a kind of revisionist organization, that it was a way for authoritarian countries to get together and try and promote an alternative vision of, of regional order. Um, and I think to the extent that um, it begins to focus more on economic issues, begins to take in countries that have very different security perspectives, like say India and Pakistan, um, then some of those concerns uh, about what the organization aims to do, about its intentions and capabilities, become less relevant. Mm, interesting. That's, of course, a perspective that uh, needs to be noted. But Mr. Young, more members, more diversified agendas, means even more challenges to proceed and implement and progress. So, SEO was accused this years ago by some of the media suggesting that it has not been having much uh, real projects that implemented, but rather a talk shop. And now, bigger size, bigger agenda, will that change? How much will it change? I think that when we talk about, as you said, that uh, some people say maybe more membership means more competition and some confrontation. Uh, so some people from just thinking from the scholars view that maybe the diversity means too difficult to really handle an organization mm. but in practical views I think Shanghai Cooperative Organization has based on the diversity at the beginning we have the different political system different culture and different history mm -hmm. but what the rule and spirit of Shanghai Cooperation Organization is that means we mutual trust and mutual respect Okay. and respect the diversity. That can be regarded rules for coordinate different countries. So I don't think it will be so challenge for the future of the extension of members. If we don't go mm. as abstract as talking about the culture, no. let's focus on some of the already existing mechanisms or visions mm. for the region, Central Asia, South Asia, mm. East Asia as well. Mm. We've got Eurasian Economic Union, that is of course very much a child of Russia. Yep. We also got OBOR, One Belt and Road, One Road Initiative, that's mainly initiated by China. Yep. And you also have regional organizations like SCO. Mm -hmm. Now SCO even wants to have its own development bank. Mm -hmm. So are we having so many visions, so few projects? Projects, I mean real rooted projects that are operational right now, Mr. Yang? Uh, maybe at, at the beginning, and uh, some people have some concerns that maybe the EU and the ICO and also One Belt, One Road will have some uh, competition. But what we show from the fact is that Russia and China have made some coordination on the two initiatives. 
and we make some dialogue and we change some views mm. and also we're talking about the very concrete ways. So that's why this time with the summit we're discussing about how could we implement of the so-called development strategy of 2025. That strategy means that it covers not only on EU but also one by one road. Mm. We've found some common projects and uh, also we, so far there's no much more project but I think it has beginning the project development period. I see. Uh, Mr. Lukin, is this a beauty contest that we are looking at uh, these days that you have so many visions, uh, projects, uh, initiatives, uh, possible mechanisms. Let's just see, let's just throw out there and see which one works. I is that what, what it is really about as some suspect? Not at all. It's not competition, it's cooperation. Uh, on the 8th of May <coughs> last year, uh, when uh, Chairman Xi Jinping visited Moscow, he signed with uh, President Putin a declaration on coordination between the Eurasian Economic Union and, uh, Silk, uh, and Chinese project of Silk Road. And uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was actually mentioned in this declaration and uh, some days ago uh, at, uh, speaking at the uh, uh, St. Petersburg Economic Forum President Putin and also President of Kazakhstan President Nazarbayev they mm -hmm. were all uh, talking about Shanghai Cooperation Organization that it can become kind of umbrella organization for this uh, coordination project so I should think that uh, all three projects I actually actually have a lot in common and can uh, and, uh, and uh, give each other a push for cooperation with each other mm. this is uh, so they don't contradict each other at all it and I'm quite sure that tomorrow the leaders of, Sh of SCO are going to discuss the role of Shanghai cooperation organization how, uh, which role it's going to play in this co uh, coordination project between Silk Road and the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Mm. Mr. Yang, that sounds wonderful, but at the same time, one cannot help but asking a fundamental question. Within SCO, there are two very important countries, even though they are all equal partners, but certainly biggest economies in the world, such as China, such as Russia. And of course, the two countries' relations are getting ever closer at this critical juncture. First, China's rise. Some people felt being threatened in some parts of the world. And certainly, that there is a need for China to have more partners in the world, including Russia. On the other hand, Russia has been experiencing some Western sanctions over the past two years or so, and some isolations as well. There is certainly a very strong strategic need of getting closer to China, not to mention the economic needs. So, but many would argue this could be temporary. This is, might not be necessarily going to be sustainable, some would argue. So, Mr. Yang, what do you make of this very big foundation, as some as assume, about the ICO? For me, I don't think ICO is, can be regarded as a temporary uh, coordination between China and Russia because uh, the beginning of ICO is uh, based on the CBMs between China and Russia on both right. issues. So that means China and Russia, we want to solve some problem between our two countries, also related to some other Central Asian countries. And uh, for me, I think ICO is, means it's not inclusive organization, means it's open to the world. So ICO is not an alignment, like an alliance or something like that. The, ICO members can join the other process mm -hmm. and the other mechanism, like China. We're talking to the ARF, some issues, and other uh, issues, uh, like even the uh, Korea issues. So maybe in the future, some people said some West countries will be involved in the process as an observer or maybe as some maybe partner in the future. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Does that sound interesting to you, Mr. Mankoff? Um, I mean, there has been some interest. Uh, a number of Western countries in some sort of relationship with the SCO. For example, Turkey um, is one of the dialogue partners, uh, even though it's a, a member of NATO and an aspiring member of the European Union. 
Um, at different times, there's been discussion in the United States about the possibility of potentially even becoming a dialogue partner. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are still questions uh, here and in a number of other countries about um, what the ultimate objective of the SCO is. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as those questions remain and as long as there are concerns about um, the the sort of authoritarian DNA um, that the organization has. I think countries like the United States will be hesitant to develop an institutional partnership with the SCO, but of course as the organization grows both in its ambitions and in its size, um, there, is, there is a lot of interest here and in, and in other Western countries about uh, learning more about the organization and about understanding it better. Well, Mr. Mankov, you keep on using ideological terms. I'm not sure whether all our panelists would really agree with you. Having said that, though, let me ask you about not only what we are talking about, our mechanisms uh, in Asia or in Central Asia involving China and Russia, but also the United States uh, at the very first term of the Obama administration, the idea of, quote, the new Silk Road was being brought up. Of course, that was not necessarily being followed much uh, later years, but what would that mean for the United States, particularly your uh, strategic thinking of uh, the region? Will that be an inspiration, the SCO, or will that be a counterfactor, in fact, to the U.S. vision, particularly the so-called uh, uh, pivot to Asia, which, of course, has also changed the name to a more PR term, mm -hmm. but what do you make of it? Well, I think, again, it depends how the, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization ultimately develops. Yeah, but, but, but um, because yes, it, is it, is, it has a lot to do with, yes, what the, how the SEO would develop, but it also has a lot to do with what exactly is the U.S. for the region. And how would that mean right. for the and U.S. I, interest? I think on the question of... Go ahead. I think on the question of connectivity and uh, transportation infrastructure, the U.S. Is, is open to cooperation with... Um, other countries in the region, you know, you've seen American officials talk about um, potentially cooperating with China especially um, and to a lesser degree Russia um, about promoting connectivity uh, through Central Asia and through Eurasia as a whole. Um, there was a time around 2009, 2010 um, when the U.S. was really pushing its own idea of a, a new Silk Road to connect Afghanistan uh, through Pakistan and India. Um, that vision has not really panned out very much and so I think increasingly there's an interest in in Washington in seeing uh, what China in particular is doing uh, in terms of promoting east-west connectivity and whether there are opportunities um, to partner there I know there hasn't been a lot of um, a lot of results from those efforts so far but there's mm -hmm. definitely some some interest in seeing what opportunities are there Mr. Lukin uh, inspirations for Washington or challenge to Washington? Well, I like this idea that the United States does not cooperate with SCO because it's authoritarian. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the United States cooperate very well with some other countries, like Saudi Arabia, for example, and it has no worries about it. So I think the main reason is not uh, uh, is not ideological but uh, geopolitical. The, the problem is that this part of the world is not is not yet under the U.S. control, and the U.S. Uh, policy is now, of course, to contain China. President Obama said it directly in his recent article. But uh, so, uh, and what uh, these countries, uh, SCO countries, and other countries of the of the region are trying to do is creating kind of. Uh, democratic, I mean democratic from the point of view of foreign policy, not internal policy, uh, de 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 democratic uh, uh, cooperation, mm. uh, kind of unity of states, uh, which President Putin called Greater Eurasia, mm -hmm. and some experts called Greater Eura Eurasia, and I think that uh, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, Shanghai Cooperation Org Organization, and China will be a three uh, with its uh, plan of uh, Silk uh, of, uh, of Silk Road Belt. Uh, will be three main pillars of this uh, Eurasian Eurasian unity mm. or new or, or the coming Greater Eurasia. You may say. I see, Mr. Yang. Before we go, final words for you. Um, Afghanistan, of course, has been a piece that the U.S. cares a lot about uh, since then, more than 15 years ago. But then, 
U.S. withdrawal from that country and security issues still high on the agenda. Will SEO play a part now? And will SEO play a complacent part to what U.S. has left behind? I think SEO has uh, played a very important role in the process of uh, Afghanistan reconstruction. And uh, in the future, I don't think maybe I have some cautious or mystic about uh, uh, cooperation between, between SEO member states and the United States. Mm -hmm. Because we have talking about issues in Afghan issues and uh, how could we counter trim them and tear them, but also as well as some uh, issues related to some countries such as uh, Iran or something like that. So I don't think that uh, SEO is a, a challenge for the strategic interest of the United States. All right, Yang Mingjie, Alexander Lukin, Jeffrey Mankoff. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you for sharing your insights. Stay with us here on World Inside. We got our final segment coming right up. To remain or to leave? After years of heated debate, the world holds its breath as British voters decide their stance in the final hours of Brexit polls. This is World Inside coming to you live from Beijing. And now let's turn to the United Kingdom, where polling is underway in the UK to decide whether Britain stays in or leaves the European Union. Over 46 million registered voters are expected to cast votes. Voting ends at 9 p.m. GMT later today, and the count will begin as soon as the polls close. The result is expected to be announced on Friday morning. Prime Minister David Cameron of the UK says he will notify the European Union immediately if Britain votes to leave. Leaders of the Leave and Remain sides have been crisscrossing the country to push for votes. Most opinion polls suggest the outcome remains too close to call even. CCTV's Richard Bastic reports. Aboard his Brexit battle bus, UK Prime Minister David Cameron summed up six months of campaigning in a single word, together. If we want a bigger economy and more jobs, we're better if we do it together. If we want to fight climate change, we're better if we do it together. If we want to win against the terrorists and keep our country safe, we're better if we do it together. Leading Leave campaigner Boris Johnson was visiting a fish market in London, insisting there's something fishy about Brussels interfering in Britain. 60% of the law of our country coming from Brussels are entire fisheries controlled by Brussels. So you take back control and I think it will be a, a big, big moment for democracy in this country and around Europe. While others see Thursday's vote as a possible liberation day. We can vote to take control of our country back. We can vote to get our borders back. We can vote to get our pride and self-respect as a nation and in who we are as a people back. The UK's referendum appears to be part of a wider Euroscepticism in capitals across the continent. Europa is nicht Europe is not in good shape. Let's not be deceived about that. Now we have to realize that Europe, which is in true crisis, needs to redefine its vision and prospects. And the British Prime Minister says, come Friday morning, if Britain still in the European Union, the campaign for reform will only just be getting underway. Richard Bestick, CCTV, London. For more discussion on the Brexit, we are joined in London by Ian Begg, who is a research fellow at the European Institute in London School of Economics. He's also an associate fellow at Chatham House. Also joining us uh, from Berlin of Germany, we are having Mr. Joseph Yanin, senior fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, Mr. Begg, uh, first of all, you are a British citizen, right? Yes, British and Scottish. Oh, have you already cast your solemn vote? Yes, I, I had the chance to go this morning before coming into work uh, after doing another radio interview. Okay, should I ask you yes or not? Ooh, that, that's uh, sometimes an impolite question in Britain, but I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you anyway. I voted Remain. <laughs> okay, we need to know your political stance quite clearly, uh, Mr. Yenian. Of course, you don't have the issue of voting, uh, observing afar from uh, Germany. But what do you make of the nature? of this Brexit vote 
in in the UK. Is it really about the UK's aspiration about the EU, or is it the vote on a self-confidence about the UK, or is it the vote on the so-called uh, glories and importance of the UK still today? What exactly is it? Well, uh, Chen Wei, uh, I believe it is all of that, uh, and probably more. You know? mm -hmm. It also has to do with, with how people feel about their country, how f they feel about their own social security, uh, how about their safety. Now, so there's, like usual in referenda, there's all sorts of considerations uh, coming together in this. Um, and at a time like this, when, when we uh, have so much uncertainty and so, so emotionally uh, debating so many principal issues, the outcome of such a referendum uh, is very hard to tell. Everything's possible now. Mm. Is it really all about the values now, the debate, uh, Mr. Beck, at the final stage of this uh, uh, debate inside your country? No, I think, I think my friend Joseph is correct that it's, uh, it's about all kinds of different things, mm -hmm. from the very narrow interest of the British Conservative Party, which has been split on Europe since the days of Margaret Thatcher, to a concern that uh, the, the results of the European Union have been less impressive in recent years. We know about the problems of the Euro, we know about the problems of the refugees, and some in Britain see this as a reason for being hostile to Europe. But the other side of that is to say that, exactly as you had in your, your piece from David Cameron, working together is the best way to solve these major problems at global level. And increasingly the European Union is, is not so much the economic project that Britain was sold in the 1970s mm. as one about international cooperation to deal with things ranging from terrorism to uh, big flows of migration, climate change, the very big ticket issues of globalization that we sometimes ignore in the, the narrow self-interest. Mm. Mr. Begg, this is no secret that Britain was quite skeptical and has been always skeptical about the European Union. I mean, Britain back in the 1957 was debating about this 1973. It joined, but two years later, it had a very similar referenda as you are having today, even though the theme of it, it could be different. Uh, but, but now, uh, 40 years later, there seems to be another one. So uh, what do you think uh, about the roles of the referenda in mm. terms of increasing or impacting the UK's role within the European Union? Well, th the first thing to say is that a referendum is an extremely unusual event in British political systems. Mm. It's only happened three times nationally, and this will be the third. And the, the, the only previous one in recent memory was on changing the voting system. Now, what happened in 1975 was that Britain had been taken into what it regarded as the European Economic Community, and I underline the word economic there. That's right. Because Britain's approach to European, Britain's approach to European integration has been very much about the transaction. Do we benefit from it economically or do we lose from it economically? Whereas, I'm sure Josef Janning will tell you this, that for Germany and France, it was much more a political project about ending 200 years of constant war between Germany and France in particular and therefore the British view was on the sidelines and it was Germany, France and the other countries in the core of Europe who wanted this much more political project. One other factor that's worth remembering from the 1950s that you mentioned is that Britain was at that point coming to the, the very end of empire. Mm. Winston Churchill was the, the last prime minister who really remembered empire and it was after that Britain made a strategic choice to go away from what was the empire and then became the commonwealth and instead to gravitate to what it, what it saw in the 1970s as the booming markets of Western Europe. Mm. So that, that's the background to this. But it's also important to stress this economic focus of the British interest rather than the political one. Mm. It's extremely interesting and rewarding that we go back to history. It really taught us a lot. It also sheds some light on the nature of debate these days, even though it's not just the economic itself, but still it is a big factor inside the debate. Uh, uh, Mr. Yan, in your view here. Well, I think Ian has made a very good point. Uh, just to remember that when the United Kingdom joined 
the European uh, community uh, members had started to try to build a common uh, foreign and security policy. What, what was, was called a European political cooperation at the time. Mm. But it meant, because so members, many member states were reluctant, Britain very much included, that foreign ministers were meeting as the General Affairs Council um, in the morning, and then they were all getting to their planes, flying to another place to meet there as foreign ministers under the framework of the European political cooperation, simply to make sure that this was not part of the European community policy framework. Hmm. So it shows you how sensitive the issues were. And I think uh, still this is at stake today. Um, there is quite a different view if you compare Berlin and London on the need for more Europe, on how strong or how uh, um, capable uh, or how powerful should the European Union as a level of policy making be. Um, how should it be used, uh, what powers it should have, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the British take a very instrumental uh, uh, point of view and very much are focused on the, on the calculable benefits of integration uh, for the German side. The overall strength, existence, integrity um, and dynamics of the European Union is almost an end in itself mm -hmm. because from the German point of view, uh, this milieu, you know, this environment uh, has been so responsive and so productive for Germany right. and um, is very seen in a very different way uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And Mr. Berg, uh, how much do you think uh, with this uh, Brexit uh, vote, whether leave or remain, uh, would have on a authority share in a way between Berlin and London when it comes to the decisions of the European Union. Of course, it is a very much a partnership among all the members of the European Union, but still, this time, the Brits are voting on this. The world is watching. Everybody becoming a little bit nervous, especially at the end of this total debate. So what would that mean for the UK's position among all the members of well, the EU? Go ahead. For, for the UK, if, if it's Brexit, it's pretty definitive. There, there won't be a second referendum right. as there was in Denmark or Ireland over the euro. This would be a, a, a big breaking point for the UK and, and the, 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 there's no easy way back in the foreseeable future if Britain votes to leave, leave now. But if it's a vote for Remain, it is going to pose problems for the other member states in, in one Britain is trying to lead reform of the European Union to say that there are things that need to change in the European Union and in, in doing this Britain, Germany, the Netherlands and Sweden are all very much on the same page. They know that the European Union needs reform. The Germans in particular would be very upset if Britain left because they would lose a voice mm. in favour of that kind of reform which uh, they, they, they rely on in, in European fora such as the, the Council of Ministers. For other countries in the EU, though, Britain's departure would be maybe unwelcome, but not so much of a, a loss as it would be as would be felt by the Germans, because they would like to take the European Union in a different direction, to be more more willing to share things amongst country, countries. Mm -hmm. And it all crystallises in, in, in debates on things like the euro and, and sharing the burden of dealing with the refugees from Syria. Mm -hmm. In each case, there's a challenge to how Europe does things where different voices balance each other in Europe and the British voice, if it wasn't there, would have to be invented by somebody else. Mm. But Minister Yenin, uh, having said that though, yes, there might be the possibility of to leave exactly by the voters' uh, results, polling result. but it could also be a statement. Even though UK eventually decides to remain, it has already been a very clear statement coming from the UK and also uh, at this moment, whatever the result is, uh, does that mean already really something for the EU? Will that something still be uh, continuing or having a lasting effect if the result comes out? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, if uh, Britain uh, or the British decide to remain in the EU, uh, it will probably not be by a margin like in 1975, where you had 67 percent saying yes. We want to stay. Now we, we we're looking at much smaller numbers. So the, the Brexit side will declare near victory. 
No? And many uh, populists and populist movements around Europe will do the same. Mm -hmm. And will say, you see, there the people have spoken. And they will, they will suggest that true democracy is only existing when people have a say about staying or leaving. No? And so this will be with us. This debate will not end in the way uh, after the referendum that it ended for a few decades after the 1975 referendum in the United Kingdom. Right. Uh, we will have this reform agenda. Uh, the EU member states will have to deliver on the renegotiation promises that were made to Britain. So that will be also a potentially divisive issue over the next year. And we will have a UK that on the one hand is is asking for reforms, but on the other hand is, is standing on the brakes uh, in European integration, uh, which is not a very a promising position if you want to reform at the same time to be very reluctant to engage. That's right. Well, you talk about what the voters are thinking. We do have some numbers. Of course, these are not final numbers at all. It's a look at some of the final polls before Brits began voting today. It probably could pro provide us some references. Financial Times been tracking polls until last day. 47% votes to say, stay, 45 vote to leave. The Times commissioned the Research Institute, YouGov, in a poll that showed the remain on 51% against 49% to leave. The public is so closely divided on the matter, at least according to the polls, right before the public go to pass, cast their votes. Of course, we could be expecting some very different results. It sometimes happens in elections, and sometimes happens in polling that people are saying one thing, but when they are really going to the polling station, they are trying to do the other. So let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Yanning. How much of this, really, is a need for the whole system, not only about domestic system inside the UK and also the EU to change, but also about the ideas of regionalization, a 28-nation uh, uh, bloc. How much of this is really just political showbiz? As we know, politics have been transforming over the past few decades. Uh, many things are about rhetoric and shows and about making a splash. So. What is your assessment? Well, I think, Chen Lei, um, this, this uh, changed uh, perception of politics, you know, this decreased respect for political actors, this uh, cynicism that you can see in the, in the public discourse about politics, that has made it all ver much more complicated for policymakers. They aren't authoritative figures anymore like they used to be uh, in the good old days. And this lack of respect also then translates into a, a different attitude uh, of voters to what policymakers are telling them. Mm. No? And so it, it is the, the current uh, um, time is, is not just irritated about what is the EU to be. But in general, you know, what is, what is party politics to be? What is the representative democracy to be? Um, and this is not something that will go away with one decision, but it is something that will probably uh, keep us busy over an extended period of time. Mm. Uh, we now understand that uh, the, the changes that globalization bring about um, arrive in society with a certain time lag. Uh, and the idea of policymakers that we actually sell to the people, right. the EU as the shield against all of the odds of globalization, doesn't fly with the electorate. I uh, see. Somehow the people are fundamentally irritated or scared of what's going on. And they are turning towards things that, uh, that, that are very traditional. Right. Like this renaissance of regionalism, of nationalism that we see, is one of those compensations of an, of, of an uneasiness with globalization. I see. Uh, Mr. Bag, uh, wonderful comments coming from Yenning, yet only leave you with at least uh, 40 seconds to wrap up. Uh, what do you make <laughs> of this overall nature of this debate? It is not just about your country. It's not just about the European Union vis-a-vis -vis the UK. It is something much beyond that, Mr. Bag. 40 seconds. 
Well, that, that's exactly right. And I think that it's, it is a consequence of globalization. It's a consequence of the, the global media news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. We have a new phenomenon in uh, social media which is driving this. But let's not forget one other thing, which is that in Europe and in other parts of the world, that the economic slowdown has its own toxic legacy. People in Europe have been enduring slowdown now, or recession for the best part of eight years, and that is causing a disenchantment with the leadership, with a focus on them saying, we cannot solve the problems. Mm. Therefore, the people are saying, well, if you can't solve the problems, go away and let somebody else try. And that's why you're getting this uh, support from the populist movements. Right. Ian Beck, Joseph Yenin, gentlemen, we are looking forward to learning the result of this referendum inside the UK, to leave or to remain. Thank some you so much. Some of us fear it. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> and that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Inside CCTV News into your search engine. You will be able to find us. You can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.